Good morning, family and friends of Spirit of Hope United Methodist Church. We are delighted that you are joining us for our live broadcast today and look forward to sharing with you in uh, ministry. In terms of our worship planning, um, today is um, suggested that it be Peace with Justice Sunday, and that has really driven a lot of our choices, of course, for today, and uh, we just want to be sensitive to that. Musically, Uh, you'll see at the beginning of your worship folder that we've reprinted the prayer of St. Francis, which I believe is just very profound and very much needed today. I'm playing a setting of it by Olive Dungan for um, the prelude, and then later it will be um, a lot of the concepts that are in there are also included in our opening hymn. Uh, And then you'll you'll see where we're headed, so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, worshiping together with you. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Good morning. My name is Jeff Hansen. I'm pastor here at Spirit of Hope, United Methodist Church. Thank you, Jerry, for getting us off and running. Um, It's a wonderful beginning. We invite you to join us for the service of worship. Stick around. Um, And to remind you that this is first Sunday of the month and we do serve communion or celebrate communion on this first Sunday. And since you're not here, Uh, You're going to have to get your own stuff together, if you would. We invite you to do that. Um, Prepare yourself, and we'll be celebrating communion later in the service. Right now, we invite you to join us in a time of singing. I welcome Jeff and Susan to the microphones to help lead us, but again, remember that this is your time to offer your voice and your heart as part of our worship. So we start this morning with giving ourselves, giving our life, giving our uh, love to God and including all that as part of our worship service. Here we go. Three. The greatest thing in all my life
that as we worship together. It just felt like it was so timely because of the events of the last couple of weeks that we talk about breath and that we sing and breathe in our Holy Spirit's breath as we take that power that we can get only from God. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my day. desperate and lost at times. The, the message of this chorus is that we have God. Amen? So God is indeed our refuge and strength, and that's why we can be grateful. Let's sing it again. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. of yin yang if you want peace work for justice and those of you who remember singing this here in the sanctuary before we do have an opportunity for you to stomp and clap <laughs> and for those of you who need to practice that pick a foot and then go stomp clap ready go stomp clap so we sing if you want peace stomp clap see aha we got it in the sanctuary so I hope you get it at home. Here we go. Instead of force, 
which everybody knows. Everybody knows you can't have peace when you make the world up. Well, uh, please join me in the opening exchange. In a world in love with weapons, may we be instruments of peace. In a world broken and divided, let us mend, heal, reach across. In a world where some cannot stand and some are intentionally held down, let us kneel together in humility and compassion until what is right and good and true raises us up to stand, work, walk together for peace, for justice, as one in Christ.
and now join me in the opening or in the prayer. All creatures of God, lift up your voice in whatever form your praise takes. The sun with its shining, the moon glowing reflectively, the earth quietly holding plants as they root and grow, rising up to blossom in beauty and produce food. The creatures that soar and sing and roar and run and swim, and you and me in, in our noise, our silence, our busyness, our stillness, our living, our dying. Let us all come humbly, thankfully, knowingly to our place of origin and our destination, you. God beyond us, God with us, God within us, yes, 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 amen. May God's peace be with you. You're invited to share a, a wish of peace, a greeting online and with one another wherever you are seated, gathered um, in your jammies with your coffee and your Sunday paper and all the attachments, accoutrement, as they say, right? We, oui. oui, yes. I don't know French, but I think that's right. Uh, some announcements for you all. I have to pull out a note or two. We are trying to um, sort of organize ourselves to assist in the um, supplying and renewing, rebuilding, cleaning up whatever is going on on uh, Lake Street and in other places in the Twin Cities that, uh, where there has been destruction. And so, this week, you're invited. Um, there'll be collection containers outside the church doors from today at noon to four, and then um, Monday through Thursday from nine in the morning to five. <clears throat> and you're, you're invited to bring um, food, canned food, uh, uh, non-perishable things, rice, pasta, um, supplies for childcare, diapers, wipes, formula, um, personal care items, shampoo, soap, toothpaste, toothbrushes, and any other supplies for cleaning and for caring for oneself, especially um, in this time for people who are displaced and um, who can't uh, get to a grocery store or another store to supply themselves. So um, bring those things in, leave them in the containers at church, and we will see that they get to a place where they can be used by people who need them. Uh, today, no, today, Friday, was Danish Constitution Day. I'm sure you all knew that, did you? You all celebrated appropriately, I'm sure. I have my tie on with the little Danish flags on. There was a gift given to me, and so I bring it out once a year around that time to wear. So just so you know, this is a special tie, and I'm wearing it because of that. Um, what's that? <laughs> um, this is Peace with Justice Sunday, and sometimes that slips by us because it falls on Pentecost or it happens um, later in the summer when everybody's gone or doing other things. But today, we want to hit it hard, even though today is also Trinity Sunday. We are talking about Peace with Justice. Um, I think we announced last Sunday that Jim Barber passed away, um, and I received a um, an email from his son, James, and um, I'm just going to read it to you. I'm writing to notify the Spirit of Hope community that Jim Barber, a devoted member and supporter of the church for 43 years, passed away on May 25th. He was preceded in death by his wife, Joanne, and survived by his children and four grandchildren. Jim and his wife were active in the church, especially the music program, where Jim sang in the choir for years, and in various volunteer programs, including delivering meals to people in need, collection of books and donations, food distribution to immigrant families. They were generous financial supporters and participants in the church, both through regular donations and special gifts, and through their work on committees and raising funds. Um, obviously, there isn't a service right now. They're hoping to have a service probably in the wintertime, um, but we will announce that when it, the time is right when it happens. I was um, 
asked about observing eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence in the service today. And I said, I don't think we can quite do that. But I'm going to suggest that we, some of us at least, try to observe that amount of silence in our daily lives in memory of George Floyd and what, uh, how long it took him to die, how long a white policeman knelt on his neck and squeezed the life from him. So um, <clears throat> some of you probably watched the service in the Twin Cities on, uh, on Friday, I think it was, Friday, Thursday, whatever day it was, Thursday. And um, they did observe that time, and it's a long time. And if you can imagine being in that position, unable to help yourself for that length of time, knowing you're dying. Um, that's beyond just killing someone, that's torturing someone. And um, there's a lot of redeeming of that to be done. So we can start in silence. So I think now, um, after that rather heavy note, you want to? Oh, announcement. Thank you, Dee. I thought you were just standing there because you wanted to be closer to me. I do. Oh, good. <laughs> Everybody feels that way. Oh, what did I do? There it is. Uh, from Chris Koiker, Devani's fundraiser for Sunshine Valley is this Tuesday, um, the 9th of June, 4 to 8 p.m. at the Golden Valley Devani's. You mention the fundraiser when you place your order, uh, Sunshine Valley gets a portion of the proceeds, so we hope you can do that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, PD. Pleasure. And now it is time to um, have children gather, and we will sing, sing into place. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. There are childish voices, childlike voices, childish voices here in the sanctuary. Um, we're going to start now a series for um, some time, since we can't have Sunday school as normal and vacation Bible school, um, the children's ministry team thought maybe it'd be a good idea to do something ongoing with some structure to uh, share some of the stories, Bible stories, that would be shared on Sunday morning with children. And so we have this book called Stories of the Bible, a Bible story book for children of progressive Christians. Yeah. And the author um, has a degree in Hebrew and Semitic language, a PhD in Hebrew and Semitic studies. Not children, you, that doesn't matter to you, but it might to the rest of you. Um, she's no slouch. And so we're going to read some of her stories that are short versions of stories. Another story we're going to read later. That's a longer version. But this one is from Genesis 1. The title is God Makes Our World. In the very beginning, before there was anything, there was God. In the beginning, there was no world, no trees, no flowers, no animals, no people, nothing. But there was God. And slowly, God began to make the world. God made light and darkness, and they became night and day. God made the earth and the air and the, the water. God made the sun, the moon, and the stars, which we just sang about. God made all the plants and animals. And then God made people, men and women, to enjoy and take care of the world. God knew that the world was very beautiful, and very good. And God loved the world very much. That's the story today. We're going to read the long version of that later. So fasten yourselves in or something. Uh, you may need more coffee for that. It is lengthy. Um, but the story talks about the creativity of God and God's um, involvement with our world and with us and God's love for this world. You heard that, I hope, that God declared the world good and that God loves this world fully and completely. Well, there's a picture 
on the front of this book that I was, I've looked at numerous times. And um, I didn't see everything in it until today. There's a picture of Jesus wow. with a couple children, a, a statue. Yes. And sitting in Jesus, you, I'm sure you can't see this, but sitting in Jesus' lap is a cat. And there's a dog down here looking up. And there's a bird on Jesus' shoulder there. And I think that's, I think the, those animals are photoshopped in there, but it's, it's, it's very cool. And it, it speaks to God's love for creation, not just the people and the children, but for all creatures. And it's, I think, something we're called to do as well. Now, my Otis update for the day is very brief. Um, Otis had company all week long. His cousin or whatever relationship he would be, Truman, um, who's a little older, who was at our house to welcome Otis when he first came to interview to see if he was going to come and live with us. Truman came and stayed with us all week, and they played and played and played. One night, Julie had to, um, as this is quarter to 11, she had to get up and go and tell them to quiet down, boys, and come. It's time to, because they were thundering around the house and out on the deck, and uh, making a lot of noise and having a wonderful time. And I think relationships, God's relationship to the world and to us and our relationships to each other, even the creatures relating to each other, is all gift and all blessed and all good and all loved. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this world in its beauty and its um, belovedness in its complexity and its sometimes messiness. And we ask you to help us be aware of the world that we are part of and the relationships that we have and are meant to nurture and how we are to care for and enjoy one another and the world you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. There are some questions in the order of service for parents if they want to take the story and go a little uh, further, go a different direction. Uh, those are there for you. All right. Jerry, you wanted to say a word, I think. Well, yesterday afternoon, um, many of the music staff from here at Spirit of Hope uh, chose to get together for a little virtual, well, a big virtual um, happy hour. And we had some wonderful conversation, and it was good to see everyone and, um, and share together. Uh, and there was some significant news that we wanted to share with um, our church family. <clears throat> uh, as many of you know, Melissa O'Neill has been uh, in chemotherapy treatments, and she was scheduled to have 12 rounds of them. And she just recently finished round number 10, and the doctors chose to do some tests um, with her. And the, the amazing, wonderful news is they could not find any evidence of cancer in the spots where they had been before. Therefore, she has been released from the next two rounds of chemo and does not need to return uh, to be checked again until September. So there is um, there's wonderful news about that health uh, environment for them as well. But also, they were so full of thanks um, to God as well as to our church community for people reaching out even as recently as this past week. So it means the world uh, to them, and I encourage you to thank God with them for this wonderful news, uh, but don't stop praying for them, and uh, don't stop reaching out to each other. Uh, it's been a few months since this all, you know, the whole pandemic started, and we all reached out within the first two weeks, and now we're kind of like, we're into this, and I think, you know, we still need to keep that reaching out. So that's really wonderful news. So I'm really happy to share that with our church family. We do have four members of uh, the community who uh, do work here regularly, and we're so grateful uh, to, uh, to be privileged to have their ministry here. Before Max Watanowicz joined us as the tenor here, um, a gentleman by the name of Dennis Curley uh, worked and sang and offered so many gifts uh, to our quartet as well as just his solo work. And I was so honored that I heard from him a couple of weeks ago. He chose to do a big project for himself where he recorded all 18 parts, not quite 18, but it's quite a few parts, to a choral arrangement that I was privileged to do with the group Take Six many years ago. It's um, based on the song A Quiet Place, 
uh, that Ralph Carmichael wrote back in the late 60s. And Jeff mentioned last week, I believe, that he likes to spend some time in silence uh, early in the morning. And for those of you who do spend time in prayer or in meditation or whatever you do to be quiet, I think this song um, and the lyrics and the tune are for you. There is a quiet place far from the rapid pace where God can soothe my troubled soul. And it goes on from there. The, uh, Dennis can't be here to sing all 15 parts at the, now it's 15 parts, but anyway, he can't be here to sing it live, so um, uh, Susan has posted it on our Facebook page, and I really encourage you to go uh, and listen and uh, uh, let it just inspire you as you listen and watch. Okay, thank you. Okay, our first reading this morning is the gospel lesson uh, from Matthew, the uh, last chapter, 28th chapter, and the last, the very end of the chapter, uh, starting with verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I should have had Susan read this reading because you're going to get tired if you're not already of hearing my voice before this day is over. But that's the way it is. We all, we can adjust. The second reading is from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so, God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together, God called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. 
So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He made them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. With the word of God in scripture, within, among, and beyond us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we took part in a march and a demonstration on Tuesday, my wife Julie and our daughter Tristan and I. It was organized by black clergy of the Twin Cities, and it was to be a, a march of clergy with black clergy leading the march, white clergy behind them having their back, and then other allies behind the white clergy backing the whole thing. And it started uh, just east of Nicollet on 38th Street and went seven, eight blocks or so from that spot to the corner of Chicago in 38th where George Floyd died, where he was killed. Walking along with this huge crowd of strangely dressed people, I was noticing these little houses in this neighborhood tucked in tightly against each other with little yards up close to the street, and noticing moms with children, little kids, out on the sidewalk and on the curb watching us go by like some really boring parade. <laughs> and I wondered, what do they think of this? What's going through the minds of those children as they watch? Children of all colors and sizes and ages. And I wondered, what must it be like to grow up in such a setting as this? Because, well, we are in part the product of the things that we are exposed to, what we, what we soak up from our environment. And so I invite you to think about the, the people and the places and the events that form and inform your life and shaped you as a young person. What are those, those places, those people, those things that, that feed you still? and sometimes pop to the surface. 
And the reason I ask is because I had one of those silly things, or maybe not so silly, come up on the wheel and, and get spit out. And I was telling Julie that I remember um, learning about the magic words, quote unquote, from Captain Kangaroo. Ridiculous name for a goofy character on a corny, silly TV program on, on, in the morning that was all about and for kids. This was pre-Mr. Rogers. But I loved Captain Kangaroo, goofy as he was, corny as he was. He was my friend. This was for children before you went to school, you know, um, uh, preschool kids then. That was our preschool, I guess, Captain Kangaroo. And I learned about the magic words. Do you know what the magic words are? Please and thank you. Yes, I'm hearing it from... Yes, okay, so it's not just me. Captain Kangaroo reinforced polite societal behavior through this program for kids. Please and thank you are the magic words. Now I wonder, are those words as important as they are to me and to us? Are they as important and formational for children who live in the neighborhood of 38th and Chicago as are the words, don't shoot, I'm not armed? Or, please, I can't breathe. What is it like to live in that setting now? What does that event, the death of that black man at the, the knee and the hands of a white policeman, or several of them, now become a memorial site? What does that do? How does that form and inform a young life? What does that do to a child? In a beginning, when there was nothing, there was darkness, there was emptiness, but there was water, interestingly enough, as the story is told, because people in the Mideast know that water is essential for life, and they don't take it for granted. And maybe even God needs water. <laughs> we don't know. But in the beginning, there's nothing, and it's dark, and it's formless, it's empty, but there's water. And there is the breath of God, this wind, just this breeze, moving over the smooth face of this water. And then God, <clears throat> I hear God, <clears throat> I'm clearing God's throat, <clears throat> getting ready to speak. And the vibration, the energy in the air changes, right, Petey? Right. There's something that begins to happen, and the water starts to ripple. And then God starts to speak, and it's just a voice. It's just sound, but you know voices can affect you, right? I still, in the wintertime, sometimes wake up with that voice in my ear, hit the deck, you guys, there's snow to be shoveled. My dad's voice that I heard again and again and again. The voice of Reverend Al Sharpton at the service on Thursday. Some of you maybe don't like him, but that voice moved people, and it moved us, even people who didn't appreciate it. That was powerful stuff. The voice of God over this water, and God begins to speak and light and darkness happen and separate and distinguish from each other. And then the sky and the sea happens and the, the dry land is, is created. It, it occurs as the water moves away, recedes, and recoalesces in another place. And so there's land for things to grow. And birds to fill the air happen and and sea creatures to fill the water happen, and earthbound creatures are spoken into being, those things that walk around and creep around. We joked at the Bible study about creeping things. That's not the creeps on the earth. That's the things that creep on the earth. There's plenty of creeps, too, we know, but we're not going there. And all of that occurs because God speaks it into being according to this story over against other creation stories, because the people who wrote the story knew other stories and were in the midst of other stories. And then, we happen. Human beings occur, spoken 
into existence, spoken into being. And we are put here to serve and protect the creation. Actually, that's not what the first story says. That's what the second story says in chapter 2. And the Hebrew words are literally to serve and protect, just like the police are to serve and protect, which I find really interesting. In the first story, we're here to do what? To have dominion. A form of that word is very popular these days, to dominate. And I wonder if the second story wasn't put there side by side with the first one in part to counter that story, to serve and protect over against domination because as we're learning again and again, domination is not sustainable. If you dominate something or someone, eventually it flips on you. It's not sustainable. It does not work. It's not wise. It's not good. And the stories are there to talk about the balance. So we're created and placed here. And then the story ends with what? The Sabbath. What we're doing here. Time to rest. Shabbat. The Hebrew word for rest, for, for review, for declaration of the goodness of creation, for celebrating it, for taking it in and, and reviewing and, and reinforcing and living into the relationships that we're given. The creation is not complete until the Sabbath happens. It needs it. It is needed. Now, there's two things I would invite you to, there's all kinds of stuff in this story, but two things I would invite you to take note of. One, and we talked about this at the Bible story, I find this fascinating, or in the Bible study. When God is about to create human beings, God seems to enter into a discussion, a conversation, that hasn't been happening before. Everything before, God just creates, just speaks it into being, but God says, let us now make humankind in our image. Us. Our. Who's that? Who's us? Who's our? Is that some sort of uh, creation advisory panel that we haven't heard about before now? Is it the heavenly host, whatever that is? Who is around for God to be talking with? It's the rest of creation that has been spoken into being and is watching and listening. And so God says to the mountains and the, and the water and the birds and the fish and, and everything else, let us make humankind in our image. What do you think? Is that a good idea? What do you think? That's not in there. I'm adding that because I think it should be in there. And if that's what the story is saying, it further suggests that we are created with this double, this dual image woven into us, with, if you will, the double helix DNA of heaven and earth wound inside of us. We are the meeting place, each of us. And if that's true, then that challenges us and calls us ever deeper into responsible, conscious relationship with the divine and with the earthly. Because they're woven together in us. We're here for both. I love that concept. I think that's fascinating. I don't know if the rest of you do. You can send in your comments. That's fine. You comment on that. Send them to PD and we'll, we'll see. <laughs> there we go. The second thing I want you to take note of is not in the text but in the context. Now, this creation story has been around a long time. These people carry it with them, and they retell this story, and it's been around in some form for centuries, and, and it's told around the fire, and it's told to their children. But it's most likely put into written form during the Babylonian exile, about 550 BCE. At that point, the temple has been destroyed by the Babylonians, Jerusalem has been trashed, and citizens of Jerusalem and Judea have been enslaved and marched off to serve in a foreign land. How would you characterize such a time? It's dark. It's empty. It's broken. It's chaotic. It's smoldering. 
it's nothing for them. There's nothing in it for them. It's empty. And as they're hanging out in Babylon, lamenting their fate, somebody says, hey, wait a minute. This sounds and seems familiar to me. A formless void, no life, no nothing in it, darkness. What does that remind you of? We have a story for this. We have a story. This is what we come from. This is, this is what we arise out of. I know this is a mess, and nobody wants this as it is now, but this is right in God's wheelhouse. This is what God does God's best work with. So it may be, as much as we hate being here, in this mess, this ugliness, this brokenness, that we are right where we need to be. It may be that right about now we are going to see and experience the emergence of a whole emergence of a whole new God ordered, God created, God blessed, God beloved, creative order all around us and even within us. That's a possibility. That's why we rehearse the story. We tell it again and again. It's not the first time we've been in an empty, broken place. So, a little confession, and this just stays here. Nobody talks about this. Nobody else needs to know, but I, I did not want to go. <laughs> I did not want to go on the march on Tuesday um, because I am an anxious sort, and I am fearful of a lot of things, and because I knew full well that I didn't belong there. I don't belong in that part of town. I don't belong in such a place. I don't belong with those. I have this thing about belonging and, and feeling at home where I am. I've, it's been my whole life, and so I struggle with that. So it hits me with every new thing that this is not where you shouldn't be here. You don't belong here. This is not for you. Uh, that was the, the one, the big thing that made me feel like I don't want to go. The other thing was clergy are supposed to wear something so that they're identifiable, recognizable as clergy, which I avoid doing all the time. So I don't want people to know what I do because people act weird with clergy. They do strange things. They say strange stuff. I get all these confessions about, well, I haven't been to church in 18 years, but I'm going to go this week just because I had this conversation with you. Yeah, yeah, well, anyway. So, but I felt... Uh, obligated. And I knew I would feel guilty if I didn't go. And my wife wanted to go, and my daughter wanted to go, our daughter. And so I, you got to go. Yeah, you're the, you're the man of the family, right? So I drag out this clergy collar, you know, the, the thing, and I put that on. I never wear that, but I wore it for this uh, with a pair of shorts and sandals. And it was it's supposed to be like 100 degrees, the heat index. It was just a heavy, ugly day. And we drove and picked Tristan up. She lives not far from where the march was to happen. And then we went and parked our car um, uh, just off of 38th, right east of the Seward Community Co-op. And got out of the car and joined this growing crowd of people who were, who were forming in the parking lot of the Sabathany Community Center there on 38th Street. And as we're standing there in the corner of the parking lot, kind of a, not apart from everybody, but trying to keep, everybody's masked, of course, and everybody's wearing their clergy garb, those who are clergy. And um, we're sort of trying to, keep away from people a little bit, waiting for our marching orders. And just the, the sadness and the heaviness and the brokenness and the emptiness of this whole thing just sort of settled in, in me, and I felt vividly empty. Uh, my own void. And then this young black man steps up and stands beside us. He's dressed in this black clergy shirt with the white band collar and a black suit with black dress shoes and a black baseball cap with a white cross and chaplain on the front. 
he is clergy and he's declaring it to the world. He's not hiding it from anybody. He wants everybody to know. And he starts talking to us. He says, hello. I am so glad you came today. I'm so glad you're here. It's so good that you came to be part of this day. I'm so happy that you're here. And he is either the best actor in the world or it's genuine. And he is genuinely delighted and he is truly a delightful human being. And I am disarmed and charmed and dragged in and suddenly I realize this is where I need to be. I am right where I belong. Because he said so. His name is DeVille Hodge. He's an elder in the Church of God in Christ, a black denomination. And the building that he works out of is a couple blocks just east and a little south of where we're gathering. And he is an elder, a full elder in this church. And we start talking about church, of course, and about being church and how hard it is to be church now because we're separated and we can't get together safely. Um, we're going to talk about that some more this week. Um, and how it's the older folks in the church. He said, in, in my church, it's the old people that want to come, and they're the people that shouldn't go anywhere. They're the folks that love the church. He says, I'm a millennial. We're, we're relaxed about this sort of thing. we got all kinds of stuff to do. So coming to church, uh, we got, we got a variety of things. He was funny. He was sweet. He was so kind. If you have Wednesday's paper, the Star Tribune. Front page, the big picture on the front page. On the right, second row, there's DeVille with the baseball cap on. You can see him. You can meet him from a distance. But here's the thing. That young black man in the black suit with the black clergy collar and the black baseball cap, who is from a very different place than I am, whose theology, I'm sure, contrasts with my own uh, intensely, who's formed and informed by experiences I have not had. He was the voice of God for me, speaking into and over my own inner chaos and emptiness and out of placeness when he said, I am so glad you're here. This is exactly where you belong. I'm so glad you're here. He was the voice of Jesus for one of Jesus' doubtful, distant followers when he said, I'm with you always. And I know you have doubts, and I know you have fears. I am with you always until this thing is complete. You are not alone ever. You are right where you need to be. You belong here, and I'm with you. If, if he could do that for me in that place, if he could be that for me in that place, then why in the world can you and I not do that and be that for one another? I don't think there's any reason why not. So, in conclusion, <laughs> you like those, right? I want you to repeat after me if you will. I'm so glad you're here. I am so glad you're here. You belong here. This is the very place you are needed. And I am with you always. Until this whole thing is complete. In Christ. Amen. If you have prayer concerns, you can send those in. We'll get to them as best we can. And some we have already received. So I invite you into a time of prayer.
Isn't that how you greet anyone who comes to your table, God? Isn't that what you say? I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you came to be part of this day, this gathering, this life, this meal. You belong here. And I'm right here with you until this whole thing is complete. Until everyone finds their place and shares in the goodness and abundance that is for all. In this time that is so hard and so empty for so many, we are grateful for our place, God. May we live the grace of your welcome in the ragged world that we are part of. Give us the courage to speak and act out of the spirit that calls life and beauty from the chaos and brokenness of these days and this time in our own hearts. May we bring healing and peace to others, especially the family of Jim Barber, Connie's brother, Glenn, Craig Kyle's daughter, Danny, Danielle, who is exhibiting symptoms of COVID, or June, healing from surgery this week. For those who have lost businesses, livelihoods, and the sense of safety and security, for those whose lives have been thrown into chaos. For all of us in our fears and distrust as we look at each other differently. For those who are healing, for Melissa and Tom and Ian and um, gratitude for the good news from Melissa. For Lorraine Lundquist, who is battling COVID-19, Sue sends that in. We pray for all who need and seek healing of any kind, for the brokenness of our world in these cities and in cities around the world. May the goodness, God, that you declare over all creation echo loudly in the life of this congregation and community, in the coming together and rebuilding of the places and lives in this metropolitan area and others that have seen protest and destruction, but now are called into a new time, one of hope and plenty and place and voice for all. In Christ, amen. There is a song or a refrain from a song we're going to invite you to sing where you are as we prepare to come to the communion table. Let us offer thanks as we prepare to come to the table. The God of all is with you. So lift up your hearts. Let us offer our thanks to God. Holy One, you speak to us in silence, yet all languages interpret you. You call us into community to live into each other's lives, and you empower us to be your voice of welcome and uplift for one another. We invite an outpouring of your spirit once more to stir and awaken us 
to permeate us and these gifts that as we share them, we may know your presence, which is our life. We remember and give thanks for those who heard your call to live in open, creative possibility and promise. For Sarah and Abraham, in their courageous leaving home, trusting you to take them to a new place and provide them with new life. For people who followed Moses through the birthing waters of the Red Sea into the wilderness of tempering search until they became a people ready to enter your place of promise. For the promise of homecoming and those exiles who held on to that promise and lived in its light. For the openness of Mary who dared to accept the call to be the bearer and nurturer of the one we call Jesus. We give thanks for him who through his life, teaching, and gracious self-giving realized the promise of redemptive wholeness available to all who are open to your ever-beckoning spirit. In that spirit, on the night before he was to die, Jesus held out the blessed and broken bread, lifted the cup of wine, giving them to his gathered friends. Take and eat, take and drink, he said. In these gifts you receive my life, the life of God broken open and poured out for the world, for you. From now on, every time you eat and drink, remember that I am indeed with you. The body of Christ, broken and given for you. blood of Christ poured out, shed for you. The bread and cup of grace and peace offered for you and for the world in the name and spirit of Christ. We remember that night that you gathered with your friends and we remember the day when the powerful word carried by your spirit's wild and windy energy broke through all barriers, pushed past all boundaries, breathed new life into the whole human body, clearing away all distinctions and calling all people into the promise of your life for good. So we receive this bread and cup in that same spirit, offering ourselves to you and the world in Jesus' name. And as we do, we pray that you will break through, Holy One, to make us truly yours, to fill us with the power and peace of Christ, to bless and break us open, to bless and pour us out as gifts of deep healing and loving challenge given to this world and all whom we meet, even as we lift up the prayer Jesus' disciples have prayed since the beginning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just so you know, as United Methodists, we celebrate an open table, and we believe that Jesus calls, invites everyone to share in this meal who wishes to do so. That welcome, that grace is for everyone, for all the world. And so I'm going to um, invite folks here to come and receive a piece of bread. And I'm going to pour them some wine, and they can eat and drink. And you're invited to enjoy what you have at home. Whatever that is, it doesn't have to be these elements. It can be toast and coffee, if that works. That's fine. But we do so in this same spirit, with this same energy that we are sharing at the table of Christ with each other. You're invited.
I was reminded that I <clears throat> moved right past that point in the service where we usually invite your offerings, your gifts, your generosity, of course, to this congregation and people who are part of it. Your contributions keep us going, and it's part of your participation in, the con- in this church, so we invite those. And as we've talked about, there's so much um, going on and so much repair and healing that needs to be done that we can contribute to in a lot of different ways through a lot of different avenues. So find um, a place or two where you can send some of your um, hard-earned cash, the gifts that you're given, and share those with others and help to um, heal this broken world and help to keep this church alive and breathing and reaching out as well. Thank you. Now, would you join me in the closing prayer? Loving God, we are grateful for the place you give us at your table, in your world, as part of your beloved creation. We know there are many who do not feel so welcome, so wanted, so blessed. Help us to change that wherever we can, so that your world is indeed a place of hospitality, peace, justice for all in Christ. Amen. Our closing song is We Are Called. And opening our hearts to that great day when all will be one, why not welcome that great day and all who belong to it today? Intending to do exactly that, God calls you to act with justice. The Spirit fills you with a tender and tenacious love. Christ invites you to join in serving one another as you walk humbly with God 
and all of God's beloved children, now and always. Amen. God bless. Be wise, be careful, be at peace. Amen. Amen.